Thank you so much for the uh, invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, earlier in the conference, I think Ivan asked a very good question. What is the future of quantum trajectory theory? Well, so here's my answer. I don't see a future, so I switch to something else. <laughs> well, I'm just joking, really. I, uh, but, uh, this is something that is somewhat different from all the other talks, but I hope you still enjoy it. It's about uh, incoherent imaging, imaging of spatially incoherent sources. For example, in astronomy, uh, you are looking at stars, or in fluorescence microscopy, you are looking at fluorescent particles. Uh, here's an executive summary about the, uh, the talk. Uh, there are two fundamental problems when you're de dealing with incoherent imaging. One is diffraction limit, which blurs your image. The other one is photon short noise, the random arrival of photons on your uh, uh, CCD. So, so it introduces noise. Uh, it's, of course, a big topic about how you can try to deal with these problems through, for example, image processing. There are two basic regimes that uh, you can deal with in this sort of problem. One is the sparse regime. If you have a bunch of point sources, they are sparsely populated either because you force the situation uh, into this sparse regime or uh, you just happen to have sparsely populated point sources. Then that's the good regime. There are a lot of neat things you can do. You can win Nobel Prizes uh, by forcing into this regime uh, using Palm or STAT and you can do compressed sensing to retrieve the locations of these point sources. So that's the good regime. But the regime I'm going to talk about is the opposite regime, your worst nightmare, where your, all the point sources are very close to each other with respect to the Rayleigh limit. And all you see in your image is really just a blurred spot uh, determined by the point spread function. And uh, even if you just look at the image, you don't need to do calculations to see that, well, this is really this really doesn't give you too much information about the, the object, apart from the overall brightness, maybe. But this is the regime I like to focus on. I like to show you uh, how people, or uh, in terms of just doing direct imaging and image processing, what would be the limits to how well you can extract information about the object from this noisy measurement that is done uh, uh, using the classical Kramer outbound. I will show you how you can actually enhance your imaging uh, by simply better measurements, better measurements than doing conventional imaging in the far field. So that allows you to get a better parameter estimation error. And all these uh, uh, new techniques were discovered through calculations in quantum metrology. So that's the summary. Applications, well, there are two big applications. One is in astronomy. Uh, for telescopes looking at stars, or uh, if you are doing biological imaging, a big uh, uh, application nowadays is to do fluorescence microscopy. So the technique, techniques we propose are applicable to both of these uh, areas. It turns out that the physics is very similar in, in these two areas. Here are some publications. Uh, we managed to publish two of them in relatively fancy journals. Uh, well, and then I got tenure, so I stopped caring about the impact factors, but, but they are still good papers, uh, the, the other ones. Anyway, so let me start by introducing uh, the basic concepts. Diffraction limit, I hope that you guys are all familiar with it. Basic wave nature of light, the light diffracts, you have a finite aperture size, so it cuts off the higher spatial frequency components, so that introduces blurring in your image, basically. Of course, it's a big problem in microscopy. For telescopes in space, you don't have atmospheric fluctuations, so you also get, uh, uh, you, you are also limited by the wave nature of light. Uh, even for ground-based telescopes in recent years, the adaptive optics has become so good that, that they are uh, very close to the directional limit. And uh, if you look at the large binocular telescope in Arizona, for example, they can get the strel ratio, which is a measure of how close they get to the diffraction limit. Uh, uh, bigger than 80%. Of course, there are bigger, even bigger telescopes that are uh, under, under construction or under planning right now, and they all envision, uh, they are all envisioned to be near diffraction limit. I put the price text there because, well, of course, uh, you guys understand that astronomy is very important. But when I give the talk in Singapore, you know, they really don't care about astronomy. So, 
So uh, the price text tells you that it's really big business, you know, really expensive uh, endeavors that, that, that people are investing in. Okay, but uh, well, diffraction limit is not the only problem in imaging. It's known that uh, if you can measure the intensity of the light exactly without noise, then it is indeed possible to get super resolution, get an enhancement of the resolution in theory to whatever degree you want, but simply by image processing. Some techniques called singular value decomposition, or if you want to fan be uh, fancy, use uh, basis pursuit, which is a big topic in, in compressed sensing. But it's possible to get super resolution simply by image processing. The caveat there is that it, these techniques are all extremely sensitive to noise. So if you have any amount of noise, that limits to how much enhancement you can get doing uh, image processing. The major noise source nowadays, uh, the CCDs are extremely good nowadays. You can get very high quantum efficiency, extremely low dark counts. So uh, the major noise source is really the photon short noise. It com really comes from the particle nature of light, the random arrivals of the photons on your image plane. In astronomy, at optical frequencies, when you're dealing with thermal optical sources, um, it is nowadays standard to use the Poisson photon counting model to model the, the, the statistics. Of course, people in quantum optics are uh, very interested in bunching, which you can see from thermal sources. But I'm sorry to say that, well, it's, it's actually very negligible. No one cares about it in practical astronomy. Uh, so, so uh, uh, bunching is really negligible, so everyone uses the Poisson's model. In fluorescent microscopy, uh, they also use the Poisson photon counting model, and because these fluorophores, they emit fluorescent light uh, uh, very weakly, so they also use a Poisson model. You could see some anti-bunching if you try hard enough, but well, it's, it's not uh, worth the effort. Uh, so uh, let me first start by talking about um, uh, a simple example of two-point sources this is, of course, the classical or classic example uh, 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 proposed by Rayleigh. We will assume you have two equally bright sources, point sources, and, uh, and you image these two-point sources under diffraction limit. Uh, your image is going to be blurred according to this orange plot. And of course, also you get photon shot noise you know, on your CCD, so, uh, so you get random fluctuations. Okay, and I'm going to assume that it's 1D for simplicity. You can generalize to, to 2D without uh, too much trouble. When you have noisy measurements, a standard way of framing the problem is to ask how well you can extract unknown information from the noisy measurements. And you can frame it in terms of parameter estimation. Uh, for two-point sources, uh, a usual question to ask is how well I can estimate the central centroid position of these two sources, the average position, theta one here, and also estimating the separation between the two sources, theta two. So the standard way of dealing with this, because the exact, est exact estimation error is kind of hard to calculate, is to calculate something called a Kramer out bound. It's a lower bound on the estimation error for any unbiased estimate, estimator. It's the inverse of something called a Fisher information. And when you assume that you have uh, Poisson statistics, then the Fisher information is basically given by this expression. F is the expected classical image. M is the photon number. So the Fisher information for direct imaging, just conventional imaging for now, uh, turns out to be diagonal with respect to these two parameters. And I'm going to focus on the separation parameter, theta two, this is the more interesting parameter. So if I normalize the Fisher information with respect to the photon number and also the width of the point spread function, this is the plot for uh, the Fisher information with respect to the separation parameter. It's a function of the true separation between the two sources. If the two sources are very well separated, then the Fisher information is basically constant. It tells you that you have a, a, a decent amount of even information. If 
you want to estimate the separation of two very well separated point sources. That's not surprising. It obeys a short noise limit. That's the normalized uh, version of it, uh, this vertical axis. What's interesting is that when the two sources are very close, the images start to overlap. You start to violate Rayleigh's criterion. The visual information actually drops to zero. If you look at the Kramer outbound, which is the inverse of the Fisher information, you see that it actually blows up to infinity when they get very close. So this is what we call Rayleigh's curse in our paper. Uh, so it tells you that something bad is going to happen to your statistics if you, if you violate Rayleigh's criterion. Uh, but, but it's not a new phenomenon. Many people have uh, found this result before. Now this is, if you're a classical optics person, then that's really, uh, you, you would expect, suspect that this is the end of the story. But we do quantum information, uh, we do quantum control, we do quantum metrology. That's really uh, 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 not the end of the story. Our playground is a lot bigger. Uh, direct imaging is really just one of the infinitely many possible measurements that you can do uh, to the photons. Uh, there might exist other measurements that allow you to do, do uh, much better measurements. If you want to know what is the ultimate amount of the photon, it, ultimate amount of the information in the photons for any measurement, we can calculate what is known as the quantum Fisher information uh, given the density operator of the light. So that's of course by Hellstrom and, uh, and, uh, and a lot of uh, very interesting result was discovered by Nagoka back in the 80s and Bronstein and Caves just uh, rediscover everything, so, uh, but anyway. Anyway, so you need to calculate, if you want to know the ultimate information, you calculate this quantum Kramer outbound and quantum Fisher information. Uh, we make, uh, of course, for thermal optical sources, we have well-known models uh, coming from Glauber about uh, how you should model the density operator, but we make a further approximation to make our calculation simpler. We look at the average photon number per mold, uh, 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 in practical situations, and that number turns out to be much smaller than one. Uh, even if you look at the light coming from the surface of the sun, this number is like 0 0.01, so, so it's very small. And uh, of course, you, you look, look at stars, this number is like 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the mi minus 10. So if it's so small, the quantum state per temporal mode, we can model it. Uh, assuming epsilon is very small. So most of the time the quantum state is in the vacuum and uh, if, if uh, 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 for a small probability you get one photon. The photon can come either from one source or the other source and because you have incoherent sources the one photon density operator is in an, an incoherent mixture. Uh, and uh, given that you have one photon from one source, then the wave function of photons, so to speak, that, that's okay to say in the paraxial regime, uh, and it's going to be determined by the, uh, the, the wave function, uh, determined by the point spread function of the imaging system. You can derive this for, starting from the uh, zero mean Gaussian P representation and assuming that the covariance matrix uh, is given by the mutual coherence matrix that we derive in statistical optics. Uh, epsilon is very small in practice and uh, I just want to emphasize that, that uh, epsilon is very small. So if you uh, ask questions about uh, uh, Henry Brown twist, that's basically two photon coincidence that probability is extremely small. It's uh, impractical to do, use that for astronomy nowadays. No one does that nowadays. So it's almost like homeopathy. So um, it's, it's, uh, don't ask me questions about Hanbury Brown twist. Uh, it's really, uh, I, I know it's a big inspiration for quantum optics, but in practice it turns out that, that no one uh, cares about it in, in practice. Anyway, so this quantum model agrees with the Poisson model that I just talked about. And you, if you're skeptical about it, uh, you, you should know that people more famous than me has uh, used a similar model, so, uh, so that's fine. Anyway, so this is the calculation. Actually, well, um, I asked my postdocs to do the calculations for me and uh, just put myself as the first author here <laughs> because I'm the boss. <laughs> 
No, they are, they are, they are, they are, they are okay with it. <laughs> anyway, so the orange curve again is the feature information for, um, for, for direct imaging. The blue curve here uh, is the quantum feature information. So you can see that for direct imaging, again, it goes to zero, Rayleigh's curse. The quantum feature information actually stays constant. So that's very surprising. Uh, the direct imaging curve for the Kramer outbound rolls up to infinity. The quantum bound is actually flat. And you can see that uh, you can almost not see the, 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 the blue curve here. It's very close to zero in, if you plot the Kramer outbound. So what this means is that if you, you can find a measurement that is quantum optimal, that achieves the quantum fissure information, and quantum metrology says that there, there exists such a measurement, then you can improve your estimation of the separation of the two-point sources by a huge amount. There is a huge gap between these two curves. And uh, uh, even though this is a simple example of two-point sources, uh, estimating the separation between two-point sources by itself uh, has uh, important applications. For example, if you want to study the relative motion of two binary stars, or you want to study the distance between two fluorescent particles, then these simple tasks uh, have very useful applications in themselves in, in both areas. Oh, we also did the calculation uh, for arbitrary epsilon, just to confirm that this, is, uh, this sort of result is OK. All right, OK, so I gave this talk in Singapore uh, two years ago. And uh, Hayashi, you guys know this guy, uh, Hayashi, a famous Japanese uh, theoretician doing quantum information, he, he happens to be there. And, and, and he was very dismissive about this. And he said, well, the, the math is so simple. So why, uh, why people haven't discovered before? Uh, well, I don't know how to answer this question. Uh, <laughs> and uh, at the end of our exchange, he's, he just said one word. You know, Japanese are very con concise with their words. So he just said one word, physics. I'm not sure what to make of it. <laughs> so I take it to mean that, well, the mathematics is, yes, is simple. Um, but, well, the, the physics is quite important. So, you know, uh, uh, so, so it's really the physics that, that, that is important here, uh, that is surprising here, so to speak. OK, and then he said that, well, OK, then, then you've calculated the quantum bound. The problem is solved. If you want to achieve the bound, all you need to do is you diagonalize the symmetric logarithmic derivative operator and then measure in that basis and do a two-step adaptive measurement in the limit of infinite copies, then you can achieve the, the bound. OK, well, OK, yes, yes, it's soft. But, but I, I'm not as famous as him, so, uh, so I cannot say the same things in, in my papers. You know, the experimentalists are just going to, uh, to punch me in the face. So, <laughs> so we need to come up with something that is more practical to implement in the experiment. And, uh, and we're just doing uh, some educated guessing. And, and uh, well, this, is, this measurement in the TEM basis, really the old, one of the few measurement bases that I know. So I just looked at it and, and calculate what its fissure information is. Give you an idea that the measurement is really uh, practical to do. OK. So, so far, I've been talking about two-point sources. And uh, the biggest next question to ask is whether we can generalize this result uh, to arbitrary distribution of sources. Any number of sources, any relative strengths, uh, brightnesses of the sources. And in the next part of the talk, I'd like to uh, tell you about the general result. Again, first of all, we look at direct imaging. So the classical image that you get is, uh, is going to be a convolution of the classical intensity or uh, the, the distribution, source distribution with the magnitude squared of the point spread function. That's, of course, a very basic result, a fundamental result in stat statistical optics. You can still calculate the Fisher information for direct imaging, still given by this sort of expression, assuming Poisson statistics. There are two questions. Uh, this is a question that people haven't studied even in classical optics. So, there are, so it's a wide open problem even in classical optics. The first question is that now you are assuming arbitrary sources 
any distribution of sources. Uh, how do you parameterize this, this problem? You know, it, this guy is in general a, a, an arbitrary function. Well, it's not negative, but it's an arbitrary function in some function space. So you, you have an infinite number of parameters in principle. The second question is, well, you have infinite number of parameters and well, you can still use, look at these formulas, but they would not be very useful if you don't have a simple solution for your Fisher information. So that's, that's a more difficult problem. The first thing we do is to make some assumptions so that we simplify the math a little bit. We are going to assume that the object is very small compared to the width of the point spread function. So we define this to be the subdiffraction regime. Basically, if you have bunch, a bunch of sources, they are all very close to each other within the Rayleigh limit. And we normalize the point spread function width to be one so that this delta parameter is, is much smaller than one. This is the assumption we make. Uh, assume that the object is very small, so, so we can simplify the math a little bit. The second uh, step that we do is to define the parameters as the moments of the object distribution. So this big F is the distribution of sources, and we parameterize the problem by assuming that the moments are the parameters. If you know mathematics, you know this moment problem, right? So in, under very general conditions, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the moment sequence and a non-negative non measure in, in, the, in the measure space. So, so it's, a, it's a general uh, parameterization of the problem. So we define the parameters in terms of the moments, hence the title of the doc, talk, uh, sees the moments. And then uh, after 50 steps, or, uh, and then we managed to calculate the Kramer L bound for this uh, parameter estimation problem for direct imaging, measuring the intensity on the image plane. And it's, uh, it, it's given by basically a constant prefactor divided by the photon number. So it has a short noise limit. But the important point about this result is that it has a constant factor here, constant prefactor here. You can de derive the special case for two-point sources uh, by looking at the second moment, which is d squared. And then you do a parameter transformation. Uh, you get back the original result, which is this Rayleigh's curse thing. Uh, you see that it's quadratic uh, for small d. So this is the first important result, a uh, relatively new result that I'd like to tell you, that we managed to calculate the kramer l bound for direct imaging for any source distribution. So that's a significant generalization of all the results that, that, that came before. The second main result I'd like to talk about here is the fact that you can also use spatial mode demultiplexing to enhance the estimation of the moments in this very general case. If your point spread function is Gaussian, which is a common assumption in fluorescence microscopy, if you are estimating the even order moments, then you can just use the TEM basis, the same TEM basis that I showed you. So doing the measurements in the TEM basis turns out to allow you to enhance the moment estimation. If you want to estimate moments with, the, with odd orders, then the TEM basis turns out to be insufficient. You need to use some other bases. But those other bases are basically, uh, uh, they basically come from taking a pair of TEM modes and do interference of, of them. So uh, if you do that, then, then you get, uh, you, you can estimate the, uh, the other moments uh, with odd others. For more general point spread functions, we have to generalize the concept of TEM modes. And that is actually possible using the theory of pol uh, orthogonal polynomials and, and uh, you get a similar result. The mean square area of this sort of uh, spatial multi-multiplexing scheme uh, is, is given by this expression. The main point here is that the, you can get an enhancement over direct imaging if you are in the subdiffraction regime when the object is very small. If you are looking at the second or higher order moments, so the self order moment is basically the brightness of the object, well, that, uh, the measurement doesn't give you any improvement. The first order moment is basically the centroid of the distribution. Also, our measurement doesn't give you any improvement, but if you start to look at a second moment or any higher order moment, 
then this measurement allows you to enhance the movement estimation. And uh, in, in practice, the bias that we, we calculate just for rigor uh, is actually negligible, uh, so, so you don't need to worry about this. So it, what this tells you is that there's a pre-factor in the, in the short noise limit that is much lower than what you would get in direct imaging. And we've done simulations uh, to show that, that indeed the theory works well enough. These are simulation plots compared to the theory. The important point about these plots is that they are in log log plots. The gap between the two curves are so huge that we have to use log log plots to, to do it. So that tells you that the enhancement is quite big. Okay, the caveat here is that, well, uh, there is a big improvement, but it doesn't mean that you can just do CSI zoom and enhance or Blade Runner zoom, zoom and enhance. It doesn't mean that you can get a huge, you know, the, the, in absolute terms, the resolution enhancement is really uh, not as impressive as, as this sounds. We get a big enhancement over direct imaging, but that is still not, 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 uh, not a miracle, so to speak. The reason is that these moment parameters, they are actually very small when you are dealing with the subdiffraction regime. So the parameters themselves are very small. The signal itself is very small. So if you look at the signal to noise ratio or the fractional error, it's, it's actually still quite large. So you still need many photons, especially if you're dealing with higher order movements. Still, I think it's a nice result that you can get such a big improvement. So if you're interested only in the second or maybe the third moments, if you're interested only in looking at the specific size or shape uh, of an object, this is still uh, useful. You can think about this in terms of the intuitive picture that I just showed you earlier. Imagine the distribution of many point sources and just think about one point source for now. The wave function on the image plane is displaced uh, by a certain amount x, big X. Taylor series expansion, fundamental mode here, plus x, uh, amplitude x times the first order mode. For one point source, the energy in the first order mode is x squared. If you have a distribution of incoherent sources, doesn't ma matter how many sources you have, doesn't matter what, what, uh, what, uh, what their relative brightnesses are. Uh, if we assume that the distribution is big F, then the total energy, because again, they are incoherent sources, spatially incoherent, the total energy in the first order mode is going to be the average according to this big F of x squared. Or in other words, the energy in the first order mode is proportional to the second order moment. So all the uh, concepts that I showed you earlier still work. You filter out the fundamental mode, reduces the noise uh, by a lot. You can generalize this sort of argument to look at what happens if you're looking at high order modes and what do you want to do, what can you do if you're looking at other moments uh, uh, so the picture can be uh, quite similar. Okay, I trust that I still have like five to 10 minutes. Uh, uh, so I'm almost done, so that, that's actually a good timing. Five, okay, so the final question of this line of uh, research is to ask whether this spatial mode demultiplexing is already the best, the optimal measurement you can do in this general case. To prove the quantum limit, to prove the quantum Kramer out bound, well, the, the simplest math that you can do is to look at the one photon density operator. It's a mixture of, uh, of uh, uh, pure states. The pure states are given by uh, a wave function here, determined by the point spread function of the imaging system. Uh, uh, this big F, again, is the mixing distribution or the source distribution. If you want to calculate the quantum Kramer out bound, this is extremely difficult. It's a mixed state, of course. The parameters are all in the mixing distribution. So I haven't seen anyone else uh, done this problem before, except in very simple cases. We are dealing with infinite number of spatial modes here, and it's not a Gaussian state uh, in general. So you, in general, you need to deal with infinite number of spatial modes. And you also need to deal with infinite number of parameters. Well, you can say that a thermal state, if you look at the exact thermal state, is a Gaussian state. But even if you, you are dealing with the exact thermal state, you still have to deal with an infinite dimensional mutual coherence matrix. So this really is the simplest way to, to, to deal with the problem mathematically. 
Anyway, we have some preliminary, preliminary result in terms of calculating this quantum Kramer outbound. And what we found basically is that the quantum Kramer outbound matches the performance of the spatial multi-multiplexing that we have calculated, uh, that I have shown you earlier. So this, is, this seems to be the end of the story, that this spatial multi-multiplexing, at least in terms of order of magnitude, is really the uh, quantum optimal measurement. Uh, the, the proof involves choosing some nice choir crowds representation or purification of the density operator. Uh, there's also an earlier paper uh, from Yale, but uh, the less said about that, the better. <laughs> I encourage you to read it uh, so, so you can better appreciate my paper. <laughs> Sorry, it's a joke. <laughs> Okay, so there are a lot of future directions. Um, we need to clean up the math. The nice thing about this conference I like is that, well, you guys all, uh, hold these conferences in the best places. Uh, the, the bad thing is that every time I come here and then I start to worry more than I need to about mathematics. So, so, so I really need to clean up the math so that, so that, uh, so that it's, it's more rigorous. Uh, there are a lot of other theoretical problems we need to study. Uh, Multi-parameter problems, uh, uh, more exact uh, calculations. There are also uh, some recent work about generalizing this problem uh, to look at three-dimensional uh, problems. Uh, okay, uh, one thing I didn't mention is that for our measurements to work well, uh, your spade device has to be reasonably well aligned with the centroid of the distribution. We've done simulations and, and calculations to show that as long as it's reasonably aligned, uh, you still get a big improvement over direct imaging. But in practice, what you need to do in terms of alignment is to, for example, split part of the light to do direct imaging first estimate the centroid and then use the centroid to align your device. So this is an example of measurement-based feedback or feed-forward control depending on your point of view. But there are a lot of uh, uh, more control, there are a lot more control problems that we need to deal with in practice if we really want to uh, 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 make this practical. Uh, the measurement, you can think of it as some kind of open loop coherent noise filtering, but if you want to make it robust, make it to work in practice, we really have to close the loop. Uh, of course, uh, we, we can now do experiments as well uh, to make this, use this for practical applications. We keep a, a frequently asked questions page on our website because we keep getting the same kind of questions uh, in optics, in statistics, in super resolution. So if you have questions, uh, you can definitely go to this website. Uh, but of course, you can also ask me questions now. This is why I'm here. Uh, OK, all right, OK. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. So thank you a lot. So questions, yes? Uh, do you know tilt locking? Uh, tilt locking. Tilt. Uh, tilt. Tilt locking. Yeah. Uh, that was uh, invented by uh, NU people uh, almost 20 years ago. That is, in some sense, interference between TEM00 and TEM01. Okay. I think almost the same as yours. But there is you are saying that it's an interference between TEM00 and TEM01. And uh, getting some information. Right, but, uh, well, I haven't heard of this tilt-locking idea, uh -huh. but I'd like to stress that uh, from what I heard from you, it's quite different from what we are doing, because here we do not interfere the TEM00 no, and so Of course, it is not interference, but uh, by using that type of trick, uh, they get some information for uh, error signal. Interesting. So, uh, well, I... Uh, you should check it in the yes, website. Please. Yes, yes, I will check the phrase tilt locking. But, uh. So I'm sure you've thought about this question a lot. Um, if you know the number of point sources in your system, um, naturally, like given the problems with measuring in the, the mode basis, I would have guessed that you know, ultimately, you want to know the position of the sources. What's the problem with parameterizing that way? 
the problem of parameterizing that way is that the math becomes a lot more complicated. So, uh, so uh, it's just more complicated math. Once you know the moments, the positions of the sources are related by polyno polynomial equations. The inverse is quite simple. You can even define the Jacobian matrix relating the positions of the sources to the moments. So once you've solved the problems in terms of the moments, it's very simple. Or uh, yes, it's possible to relate these two problems. It's just that the math is a lot cleaner if I look at the moment parameters. Right, well, it, in, in that case, I mean, it, you are solving polynomial equations. So assuming that you have a certain number of sources, you need a certain number of moments to, to get back that, that position. So uh, does that answer your question? Or? Beautiful talk. Uh, I wonder if your method also comes with a way to infer velocities from a time-dependent measurement. Velocities? Yes. Time dependent measurement. Measuring over time, you want to infer. Measuring over time, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, that I can answer. Velocity, I'm, I need to think about it. But in terms of time domain, spectral domain, you can apply the same theory to time and frequency domain. And in fact, people have already done an experiment on that. Uh, let me see. Excuse me, uh, paper number six here. They apply the same ideas to time and frequency domain in terms of estimating the uh, average time of arrival of a pulse and, and the average center of a, of, of a, a pulse. So uh, yes, it will still work. In terms of velocity, I will have to think about it. Ah, well, if you are thinking about it in terms of Doppler shift, then you're estimating the, the average frequency of an optical pulse, so, so yes. Ah, you mean multiple pulses, then in terms uh, I need to think about it. Daniele. <coughs> yes, uh, so when you compare, uh, say, your improved image uh, to a direct imaging, you told her that it critically depends on the alignment of your space system. Uh, sorry. It, de it critically depends on the alignment of your space of systems the of this, on, yes. on your source. It means that the improved picture sort of depends on the on this alignment. So how do you know you have you really pick the the right one? And do you have examples to show to us of improved pictures? Improved pictures. It is. We try to be extremely conservative about our arguments, and we try to say. Yeah, improved pictures, showing pretty pictures is in the plan of our future work. So I, I really don't want to claim anything about uh, it. So you don't want to show any example? I, uh, yes, because you know there, there, there are a lot of papers in the literature about improved resolution, improved pictures, and they turn out to be bogus. So, so we want to be quite rigorous and conservative about this, and we want to frame this as a parameter estimation problem, then we can be rigorous about it. In terms of pretty pictures, uh, I, uh, uh, you, you will have to wait, sorry. Uh, <laughs> we, we will do that later. Thanks. But uh, yeah, <clears throat> it is still a, an ill-posed problem. I'm not sure if you heard about that phrase. So you have to introduce some kind of regularization. So we got, get these, all these parameters. We still need to do some kind of regularization to, to get back the image. We've done some preliminary work on that, but, but not for public consumption yet. Any other question? If not, thank you again. Thank you.